The goal of this video is to test the definition of differentiability on this function at the origin. We will reach a conclusion, and then we will find our conclusion again a second way using a theorem, which is actually going to be much faster. I think both approaches are worth watching. So the first thing we're going to do is compute the partial derivatives of this function with respect to x and y at the origin to propose a Jacobian matrix, and then we will test if our function is being suitably approximated by its first order approximation near the origin. That's like checking this function using the definition of differentiability. But then I will say, here's a theorem we could have used that will give us the conclusion faster. Again, please watch both. All right. This function is piecewise defined. So here we're saying f of x and y is x times y divided by x squared plus y squared whenever x and y are not both zero. Otherwise, it's zero when x and y are at the origin. If you want to take partial derivatives to, say, form the coordinates of your Jacobian matrix, your function should be consistently defined in an open neighborhood around the point in question. So here, that's not the case, because our function is defined differently at the origin. As soon as I step away from the origin, my function changes. You can't differentiate x, y divided by x squared plus y squared to get information about the partial derivatives at the origin. You must use the limit definition. I'm going to do that right now. And as I do so, I want you to notice that actually the limit definition is not bad. Um, often students are a little bit nervous about using the limit definition of the derivative. Here it's going to be the limit definition of the partial derivatives. But you will see that not only is it the only correct approach here, but if you set it up correctly, it, it's really not a bad computation. In fact, it's pretty clean. So what we're going to say is uh, we need to compute the limit as h goes to 0 of f of, we'll start at the origin but perturb the x-coordinate only by h. Compare that to how f behaved at the origin, and then compute the rate of change by dividing by h. To evaluate this limit, this is f of h comma 0, where h is not 0. In a limit here like this, we imagine h is getting closer and closer to 0, but it's not at 0. It's getting to 0. So to compute f here, we will use the first line because our x-coordinate is not 0. OK, so let's start simplifying this. Uh, I'll write this out in full detail so that you really see what happened. This is going to be the x-coordinate times the y-coordinate divided by the x-coordinate squared plus the y-coordinate squared. So this is f of h comma 0 minus f at the origin is literally 0. And then we divide by h. I want to write one more thing to make another point. The numerator here is 0. Sometimes students look at this kind of expression where we're trying to take the limit as h goes to 0 of 0 divided by something which is going to 0. This is not an indeterminate form. This is not some, something that you would need L'Hopital's rule for or something like that. This is literally 0. And if you need a little bit more convincing, if I take the limit of this expression, this quotient, as h goes to 0, imagine that h is 0.1 what would this quotient be? 0 divided by 0 0.1 is 0. What about if h was 0 0.0001? Well, 0 divided by that number is still 0. So as h is going to 0, this quotient always exists and it equals 0. So its limit must follow that trend as h goes to 0, it's 0. Okay. I just want to say that because sometimes I see some uncertainty or hesitation on students' faces when they arrive at this point. Uh, therefore, we've computed the partial derivative of this function with respect to x at the origin. I could set up and evaluate the partial derivative of this function with respect to y at the origin and go through the computation again, but I don't think it's worth doing here because this function is symmetric with respect to x and y. So it's like if you interchange their roles, you're going to get the same computation. So let me also mention that we now have the partial derivative of f with respect to y at the origin. And I got to that by the symmetry of the roles that these variables play in the definition of this function. If you'd like to, though, you're welcome to set up that computation. I'll give you a moment to do so. If you just want to check that you set up the partial derivative with respect to y at the origin correctly, here's what you would have needed to write down. I switched from h to k, but that's just a stylistic choice. In this situation, you would have f of 0, comma k minus f at the origin divided by k. But then once again, once you compute that, because it's going to follow the same train of thought that we used when we assessed the partial derivative with respect to x, you'll get 0 of 2. 
That means that our Jacobian matrix is going to be df at 0, 0. I think it's always worth stopping and thinking about the dimensions of everything you write down when you're doing multivariable calculus. Here, our function f is a map from R2 to R. That means our Jacobian matrix should be a 1 by 2, should be a rep. It's going to be the partial derivative with respect to x and the partial derivative with respect to y, both at the origin. OK, so we have this Jacobian matrix of zeros. We are now going to test the definition of differentiability for this function with this matrix. And we will see if that limit that we have looked at will go to zero as x and y approach the origin. I have said a couple of times, like, you should really know the statement of differentiability. So let me step away for a moment and try to write down the limit that we're about to do. All right, what we want to do is set up the limit as x and y go to 0, 0. I'll write them in vector form like that. Of the size of f of x, sorry, f of x and y here, function of two variables, minus its first order approximation. That's the sum of two terms. I'm going to go ahead and distribute this negative to write minus f at the origin, minus the Jacobian that we computed at the origin, times the vector x minus 0, y minus 0. So that's like x, y minus 0, 0. Everything here is scalar value. That's why I put absolute value instead of vector norm. The quotient is going to be the norm of x, y minus 0, 0. All right, let's plug in what we know. Uh, I think I can actually do it here. So we'll say this is the limit as x and y both approach 0. Again, x and y are going to the origin, but they're not there. That means this first term I know unambiguously to be x, y divided by x squared plus y squared. And then I notice that here, this is f at the origin, so subtract off 0. And then our Jacobian matrix we just found to be 0, 0 times, how about we write this as x, y? like so. And then this norm is the square root of x minus 0 squared minus, or sorry, plus y minus 0 squared. OK. Happily, most of this is going to cancel out. We are left with the limit as x, y approaches the origin of, I think we can rearrange terms here. I'm going to take the absolute value of x, y. And then x squared plus y squared is positive. Bring that down, combine it with this. We have x squared plus y squared to the 1 plus 1 half, so 3 halves power. Oops, there we go. OK, I think I simplified this correctly. I will show you maybe two different ways to um, get to the answer here. But if you're feeling really good about these kinds of multivariable limits, go ahead and try to work it out yourself. And I will come back and finish this. OK, I moved this line up just to give myself a little bit more room. We want to take the limit as x and y both approach 0. If you look at this, it's of the form 0 over 0, but that's no surprise. So we expect usually to have an indeterminate form in this situation. That means I need some kind of technique here. One is to go along paths, and the other is to switch into polar coordinates. Let me start with polar coordinates. For polar coordinates, I'm approaching the origin. So I'll set x to be r cosine theta and y to be r sine theta, where here r represents, say, positive distance to the origin, and theta is the angle that we open up with the positive x-axis. In polar coordinates, technically r could be negative, but for us, I'm going to imagine that we are, let's see if I can squeeze the picture in here, sorry. We're trying to approach the origin. So, you know, how are we approaching it? Who knows, right? Like this, maybe. And so I'm going to imagine that r is decreasing down to 0 in this limit. So I start maybe away from it, but then r is going to shrink to 0, driving us to the origin. The angle theta, we have no control over in general. So in this kind of wild path I drew to the origin, theta you know, moved around. It changed. It was a function of r, essentially. It's like it changed as I moved towards the origin. 
if you come in along say an axis, theta might be constant, but basically when you switch to polar coordinates, you want to imagine that you have no control over theta whatsoever, and also treat it like a function of r. Don't even pull it out in front of the limit, like leave it in the limit. It varies potentially as r changes. Okay, so this limit now is going to turn into a single dimensional limit. I will write that r is approaching zero from above. The product up here, we can write as a product of these two conversions. That's going to look like r squared times the absolute value of cosine theta sine theta. And then x squared plus y squared in polar coordinates. It's really important that you see this immediately. Um, this is the kind of identity that whenever you switch to polar coordinates, you don't want to have to like stop and think about or rederive. Always know in this kind of conversion where our polar coordinates are centered at the origin, x squared plus y squared is r squared. So here, this is r squared raised to the 3 halves power. That's going to be r cubed. So I have r squared divided by r cubed. Let me simplify this right here. Okay, that cancels out with this power, leaving us with one copy of r in the denominator which means that in general, this limit does not exist. I will talk through this a bit more. If, let's say I came in along the line y equals x, so that theta was pi over four, this is just some positive number, right? So neither of these trig functions would be zero if I came in along the, the line y equals x to get to the origin. So we would have some positive number divided by something going to zero. Obviously, that blows up. That's enough to know that this does not exist. Uh, so this is switching into polar coordinates. And this is honestly what I do when I see this kind of computation. It's my go-to. If I want to assess um, the limit, say, in two-dimensional space, as x and y are approaching a point, I like to switch to polar and assess it that way. If you wanted to, you could come in along paths. And let me tell you just how to do that out loud. You're welcome to, to try it in just a moment. If you look at this expression, you could say, what would it look like if I came in along either axis? So maybe I approach the origin from the positive x-axis direction or negative or along one of the y, along the y-axis, basically. Then the other coordinate is 0, which means that this numerator is 0. And this denominator would be a non-zero number squared plus zero squared. So it would not be zero, which would mean this quotient would be zero. So we would have a zero limit in that situation. That agrees with what happens here. If I approach along either axis, one of these trig functions will be zero, which wipes this out. Otherwise, our limit is not going to exist. OK, so overall, the, the conclusion is that as x and y approach the, the origin, there is no consistent behavior. The limit does not exist. Therefore, this function is not differentiable at the origin, because when we set up this limit that we want to test to check its differentiability, the limit did not exist. What we needed was it for it to be zero. So even if it had existed and been one or something like that, it would still not be differentiable. This must exist and be zero in order for our function to be differentiable at the origin. All right, so that was checking differentiability here with the definition. Let me step away for a moment and let you experiment with these ideas. You can try the paths approach if you'd like. Then when I come back, I will show you a much faster way that, you know, if you see it, if it's relevant, great, use it. I don't actually know that I would have immediately recognized it in this particular context, but I'll show you that there's a theorem that gives us that F is not differentiable very quickly. Here's the relevant theorem. We have proven that if f is differentiable at p, some point in its domain, then it's continuous there as well. In this context, we're going to use the contrapositive, which is logically equivalent. The contrapositive tells us if f is not continuous at p, then f is not differentiable at p. Oh, right here. f is not diff. Turns out this function is not even continuous at the origin. If we had seen that right away, we could have said there's no reason to compute these partial derivatives and put together this Jacobian matrix. If it's not continuous at the origin, it's not differentiable at the origin. So how could you see that here? Well, what we want to check, let me just write down the shorthand definition of continuous. This function would be continuous at the origin if the limit as x and y approaches the origin of f of x and y 
exists and equals the value the function takes at zero, zero. So this is what we want to check. Once again, this is a multivariable limit, which means that there are a couple of different ways you could try this. You could check paths or you could do polar coordinates. Since I did co polar coordinates just a moment ago, let me do paths instead. You're totally welcome to check polar coordinates on your own. In fact, if I were just doing this for myself, I would use polar coordinates. But let me check two paths. So if I check along the x-axis from either direction, what I need to do to place myself on that path is set the y-coordinate equal to zero. That becomes the limit as, uh, let me just say x goes to zero, here y is zero, of f of x and y where x is not zero but y is, that places us on the first line of this function. So I'll write this. Oh, sorry, we're not doing a partial derivative. I just need to plug into the function. Okay, here we go. Okay. What uh, is the behavior of this expression as x goes to zero? Well, that's going to be the limit as x goes to zero of x times zero divided by x squared plus zero squared This is zero, this is not zero. We've seen this before when we were computing partial derivatives. So we have something which is identically zero over something which is just approaching zero but isn't actually zero. So this limit exists and is zero. Okay. On the other hand, what if we check along the line y equals x? Okay, let me just see if I can squeeze this here. Then we get the limit. I'm going to take y and replace it with x. Um, let me go ahead and put in x for y. We have x squared divided by x squared plus x squared. So what was xy is now x times x, and then what was y squared is now x squared. But this is actually 1x squared over 2x squared. So the x squares cancel out, and you get 1 half. You may notice that if I had begun with this computation, I could have stopped, because this line tells me along the path shaped like y equals x, the limit of the function exists, but it equals a number which is not the value the function takes at that point, and that's enough to say that this definition of continuity right here is not satisfied. So this function is not continuous at the origin, therefore it's not differentiable at the origin. Read together, these two computations tell me that the function is trending to different numbers as I approach the origin. So it's not like my lack of continuity is a removable discontinuity. It's really fundamentally the case that this function cannot be well like cannot be defined as going to one particular number as we approach the origin. I'll put up a picture in just a moment so that you can see what I'm talking about. But before I do that, I want to emphasize something here. And that is that we were able to compute partial derivatives for this function, and yet the function was not differentiable. So the existence of partial derivatives, your ability to write down something that looks like a Jacobian matrix, is not the same thing as differentiability. That is fundamentally different than single variable calculus. In single variable calculus, where you have a function of one variable, your ability to compute, say, f prime of a is the same thing as having differentiability at a. Here it's different. Your ability to compute partial derivatives is not the same thing. Let me just give you like a very quick overview of why that would have to be the case. <laughs> okay, that's R2, that's the domain for this function. My ability to compute partial derivatives tells me that I understand the rate of change of my function along these two coordinate axes. But my domain is so much more than just the coordinate axes. I've got you know, quadrants here and here. So by computing how the function behaves along the coordinate axes, you aren't getting enough of the picture of the, the function, its true behavior, because you just have two slices in its domain. In single variable calculus, your domain is one dimensional. So it's like if you can say that behavior is nice in this one dimensional sense of direction, that's all there really is to assess because that is the domain for the function. So that's why partial derivatives on their own don't give you enough. Uh, we'll have more results kind of building up our, our theory about this. I just wanted with this example to emphasize that you can write down a first order approximation and yet it's not a, a good enough approximation for your function. Let me wrap up this exercise here, but I want to leave you with 
a picture of this function that I made on a computer. And I'll kind of spin it around for you. I'm going to try to highlight both the axes, the line y equals x, where we know our function is tending to the value 1 half, as well as y equals negative x, where you'll see it, it goes to negative 1 half, so that you can see you know, what this function looks like. You'll notice these values. You might kind of spot you've got 1 half, 0, negative 1 half, so kind of three different heights along the path that we looked at, but you also get to see kind of this more global picture of how f behaves over its domain. In particular, because this function is not differentiable, uh, we're going to see this kind of pinching behavior. So as you get closer and closer to the origin, there's this sort of steepness to this function. And you might be able to link that to some of the behaviors that we worked through when we assessed differentiability the first time we concluded that this function was not differentiable. Okay, I think I've said enough. So I will step aside and leave you with just the graphic of this function. Thank you for your attention.